Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Championship Leadership Podcast. I'm excited we have David Kidder with us here today, CEO of uh, Bionic, and uh, we'll learn much more about him and, and his company as we go into this uh, episode here today. But thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Very grateful, Nate. It's, uh, it's wonderful to spend time together. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to ask this question to everybody that comes on the show to kick things off is the name of the podcast, Championship Leadership. So what comes to mind for you? What, what does championship leadership mean to you when you hear, when you hear that? Uh, service. Uh, most of the champions that I've known uh, are both like um, a player, a, a, a head coach and an owner all at the same time. All, all the dimensions of, of, of owning the outcome of any endeavor together as a team is taking complete responsibility, but not in, this, not in the service of the self, but uh, to serve the team for the outcome. Yeah. The famous John Wooden quote, which is, if you put 110% of the field, the score will take care of itself. Individually and collectively, that's what leaders do. Yeah, absolutely. Big fan of John Wooden, by the way. I'm surprised we haven't talked more about him on this uh, show today, but, uh, but uh, he's all of, he was all about that, right? He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he never talked about wins and losses. He, he just talked about uh, the, getting the best out of, out of the young men that he was, had his uh, hands on for the time that he had them with. So are you a big yeah. uh, fan of John, John Wooden's or like? Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I grew up playing sports, uh, played at college level lacrosse. Uh, I have three sons, 10, 13, 15, all competitive, uh, have coached them for years, but also more in their life and their mindset now than anything else. Um, uh, with, with them, for them, that's sort of like, that's sort of like the, uh, you're like the head coach and owner of the team is how I like to look at my role now in their lives. Um, but more importantly is just is what is winning and uh, what is winning is really about the effort they put in the field um, and how they think honestly it's uh, so they're so hopefully their lives uh, they're experiencing things these small experiments on the field about testing themselves is really one through a mindset of abundance and not fear so they're trying to not um, as they say you can't take a bat to a broken table right you can't yeah. demand they grow but they grow in the endeavor. And so uh, are they learning? Um, if they don't like the result, fix the system. You know, you're more than your failure. Those are the key ideas so they can actually move through the struggle because we all have that, right? It's, uh, there's never a moment where you get to the top and you realize what most people realize is that there's nothing there. It's about the journey, the valley, and really solving problems. It's just another set of problems and it's, that's never going away. So uh, there is no escape. There is no winning in that context. It's all about growth. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. My, I have three kids as well, and I'm a little bit behind you, uh, 13, 11 and eight. And, uh, it is, it's, uh, you know, I realize that I only have so much time with them. Like, like hopefully I've, of course I'll be a part of their world for forever, but for as long as I'm around, but, uh, but so much time is in like really to impact them in, inside of my home. And, and uh, it's always uh, interesting to, to travel that road and, and to try not to overstep my bounds here and there and try and let them grow and experience and ask questions. And, and uh, so it's, it's been an interesting journey for me too, as a leader, as a father, definitely. Yeah. It's the, it's the most important work. It's the greatest work. I mean, I think they say you spend you 90% of your parenting time is done before the age of 13. Yeah. So if you'll get to your kids and yet, I mean, with three sons, when I, when I, when they turn 13 in our family, I have this, this evening called steak night, K N I G H T. Yeah. And, um, so we're not Jewish, but a lot, we've got a lot of bar mitzvahs here, uh, where I, where we grew up and the kids use that, but I use this night as a, as a, um, as a bright line in the check, my son's lives where they're now young men and the expectation mm -hmm. It's not impossible, but it's going up. But the expectation is not on them, it's with them. And um, there's a great line I read years ago about if you really want to affect someone, uh, you say, can tell them, you can say, this is the exact sentence actually is, I have high expectations for you and I know you can achieve them. And what it does is it, it helps them um, say, I believe in you. You have accountability to yourselves and I believe you. And when they say it in classrooms and they find that teacher who believes them, there's a magical power in that sentence around ownership and expectation. And 
I use that night, steak night, to draw that demarcation. And so I host a, a dinner with uh, my some of my mentors and my my father and my brother-in-law and Jenna McChrystal and others, and then five of their friends and their dads. And it's for it's for the sons and their fathers and these outsiders. And everyone writes uh, a letter to their young selves. So the men write their letter to their 13-year-old self, but in truth, it's a letter to their son. Yeah. And for that next, yeah. it's a very serious night. So the next three hours. There's not a dry eye. And the boys realize that this is like a very serious night. This is not a party. This is a coming of age moment. And it's a great opportunity for the dads to tell their sons, like, what would I do that I'm proud of? What would I do differently? And more importantly, what's the best advice, that hard advice? And I create a little book out of this um, to commemorate it. But more importantly, it's just great wisdom. But it's a watershed moment. And so when they come out of this, for my two sons have gone through it, um, it, it's not like they suddenly feel that like the world is pressure. It's more about where, where do I want to take my life? You know, where do I want to lead myself? And, you know, when I fail on the way there, I have to look at the mindset and the systems of how I'm leading myself. You are not a failure. <laughs> the system failed you. And if you're like you, but you are the system, but you could change it. So that systems thinking, the lessons, the learn journey helps just help them learn that they are a function of the, what they believe and how they, lead themselves. And we focus on that machine, so to speak, in their mind to lead their lives. I love that. That's, uh, that's incredible that you do that. Uh, it reminds me of a book I read and, and I can't remember the, the gentleman's name. I believe his first name was Robert, but that doesn't help us. Uh, and it was, it, it, it essentially was a book about raising young men and raising his son. And there were different points throughout where he would do very si uh, similar rituals to what you're talking about. Um, to kind of, you know, at, at the major points, like 13 being one, right? Where it's like, yep. hey, you know, now that's life is a little bit different. You know, we're kind of leaving the child behind a little bit, maybe, and, and mm -hmm. uh, stepping into that um, first stage of manhood. So um, powerful. I love it. And now it's got my head head spinning to, because I've always, you know, you read something, you think you're going to go do it, and then you never really follow through on it. So um, yeah, appreciate that. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Um, it, Outside of the book that you give them, I, I am also curious, do you, is there anything else that you present to them as like a symbol of, of this night for them? You know, I um, just that they're not alone, you know, like they they I think once they can, they see you as a human. They see you as um, a man, but also they can see themselves in you. They can see ah, there's the demystifies the bridge of young adult to an adult to a father. And, um, you know, there's this great book called uh, Peak. I think it was by Chip Heath, the brothers. And it was all about how to, how to create peak moments in life. And because you know, it's like a vacation. Like you, if you, um, you only remember the moments on as a child that are like, you know, seared in your mind, right? A, you know, a car accident that happened to the family or a great moment or your first thing you earned and saved for or a, a roller coaster. So when those endorphins go, or that, that dopamine goes in the mind, it's structuring around a moment. So the question is, how can you intentionally shape your child's life with the key marks of yeah. those peak moments that you can create? Because they're, they're going to have, they're going to have moments. They're going to really, in many cases, psycholog psychologically disfigure them. <laughs> uh, and it, create, it, it can do one of two things. It can harm them for the rest of their life. Or and create shame that they will then become a you know dope addict of performance trying to feel better, or you can um, in, with intention um, intentionally refigure their mind through peak, peak moments. And I think that you you know this is just an example of one, but um, you know I, I, I you know developing a passion with the kid and then having a peak moment. So like for example, uh, right now with my older sons we watched this great series on F1 race driving on Netflix, right? I'm not an F1 fan, but I become one because of the show. Yeah. And like, I, I want to, however we're going to get there, I'm going to take them to one of those races. Like, mm -hmm. that's an example. We don't need to do it 20 times. It needs to be to have it. It should be once. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's, that is, it's either your kids or your teams, the power of intention and peak, I think are really powerful ideas about how to shape what they do. Mm -hmm. So I, I want them to put on lenses that they view the world through that are from these moments that help lead themselves. So I don't want to steal every peak moment in their life. I don't need to do that. They'll have their own uh, partner in life and they'll have their own kids, I hope, if they want to. 
and they have their own faith and they will find these, but I want them to learn, like, there's a lot of mountains to climb, but I'm going to take you to a couple yeah. and those will be ours. Yeah. Uh, that's incredible. So yeah, thank you. And then I didn't necessarily, uh, imagine us going down the, the parenthood, uh, conversation here, but it's been, it's, it's good. It's great. Needed. What's, uh, who are some of the championship leaders that have impacted your life? Um, and it's always less about who they are, although please feel free to share who they are if, if you're comfortable with that. Um, but more so like what, what are some of the characteristics that really stand out, whether it's a coach, a mentor, or some, some leader that has really impacted you significantly inside of your path and journey in life? Well, one that comes immediately to, to mind is uh, Beth Comstock, who is the vice chairman of GE. And, um, you know, I have, I, you know, she really helped create my most recent company, Bionic, uh, which is, you know, a model that we've sort of, I guess, invented called the Growth OS, which we've been down doing for eight years with, you know, some of the biggest organizations in the world. And it's the idea that um, in the same way, um, you know, a big organization tries to get bigger. It's really about de-risking. We call, I call it big to bigger, right? We have advanced master's degree of administration. It administrates what exists, but growth always lives in discovery, right? It's not, you can't, you, you don't plan for something that is no unknowable. You can only discover the unknowable, right? <laughs> and so our, our belief has always been that, you know, venture investing or growth investing and entrepreneurship are forms of management. The same, we have an MBA who manages a big company with you know teams that do that work. Um, you also have special forces, right? And so we built a model that replicates the the model of growth investing and entrepreneurship as a form of management that sets up portfolios and new needs in the world. Beth really pioneered that with us, and so she worked at GE for 25 years. She helped um, really helped get the company to the edge of the key growth opportunities over the last sort of 30, 25 years in energy and healthcare and digital. What the GE's challenge was, was actually getting those things inside the company. So mm. part of GE's challenge today is, is how do we get those changes inside? And so she retired a couple of years ago, but I, what I loved about her was um, she was always an experimenter. She was an unlearner. Um, she was courageous. Um, she was a truth teller. Um, she wasn't afraid to go against the norm and, but you always felt like you were with her and together, uh, they, I remember saying once to me that together is the most powerful word in business. And I think that's true. Um, the question is, is how strong is your together? And she was just someone who really did those things well. So I admire her a great deal. I have a lot to be grateful for. Her. And yet, you know, the results of some of her work were challenging because of how it turned out, but it taught us a lesson, which is, you know, leadership's job is to learn. Um, and companies are always a direct reflection of the leader's mindset. It's inescapable, especially when it's small, like a startup, it always is. even if it's big, I think leaders fail to recognize how much influence they truly have. And what I really believe is at the heart of this is the issue of permission. Permission to tell the truth, permission to discover, permission to set down old truths, permissions to grow. You know, you are ultimately the ceiling of what you allow the company to actually grow to. And when those things break, um, what's underneath this is really a mindset of fear versus abundance. Um, the, the control mechanism inside a large organization that leaders have been trained and reflect are mostly around fear. They're playing not to lose. But when you meet a CEO who truly is playing to win, they are abundant, fearless with absolute permission, and they will accept the truth. I just think that there are very, very, very few executives who lead with those beliefs because they are fear-driven, control-driven, and they are the ceiling and the ceiling of permission. The ceiling is quite low. Uh, Beth was the opposite of that in so many ways. Um, that's why I you know, have such deep, deep respect for uh, her and her work. Do you ever run into companies that, that, uh, that have operated from that abundance mindset um, for for a long period of time, and then something happens, and all of a sudden, uh, make a switch to fear driven. I mean, uh, Nike has gone through moments like that. Nike is an abundance driven company, but has also gone through moments of pulling back with fear. There are partners for us for a bunch of years. Still very friendly with the team over there, but I, you know, having gone through moments with them where um, that was, you know 
for and against those ideas was part of their journey. And yet they still believed in their purpose. I just actually just wrote a piece uh, this last week on LinkedIn about um, doing the next right thing into your purpose. And, you know, it, where the boundaries of, of what we know and don't know, the knowable and unknowable, and what we control and we don't control, the controllable and uncontrollable, the boundaries around those things, both in perception and reality, have gotten really tight, right? What we control and what we know is actually much smaller than really ever before because of the pandemic. Yeah. And so I think we're looking at like, well, how do we lead in this, in this moment where we control a lot less and we also know a lot less? And also inside that box, right, is just our lives, right? It's our light, our leadership life. It's our relationship life at work. More importantly, at home with our kids, our spouses, partners, ourselves. And, I'll, and what I think is really happening right now is that we, a lot for a lot of people, we're looking at it and saying, I don't really like what's in the box. Yeah. Because I don't, there's no distraction. Right. There's no business travel. There's no, fee, right now, you're just, you're staring it down. So there's a lot of like um, big questions to be asked. So the question is, what do you do right now? Um, and so most important question right now, right now is, is in the absence of a map and my planning and my, the myth of control, <laughs> um, where, where am I leading this thing? And that's a question of like, where is my North star? Mm -hmm. And that North star is the purpose. So if I'm not, if I'm not leading into my purpose in the absence of a math, that's truly the only thing that guided me. And if I don't like where that, that North star is or what it is, that's a big problem. And I need to define it for my teams. And then also is if I don't like what's in the box, that the, the relationships in my life professionally, that's equally a big problem. That comes down to culture in the home, culture at work. So I think we're going through like a great, I wrote that this year ago, just a complete defrag, <laughs> reset, yeah. unplug the system, restart it. Yeah. You know, personally, like I wrote the, Bionic, the purpose of Bionic years ago called uh, saying that we ignite growth revolutions. That's not about money. That's the interior life of the leader. Mm -hmm. And we are that person right now. So I think this is a remarkable moment and opportunity for people to reset, defrag, make sure they're following the right, the purpose that they're born to do. And more importantly is, is to increase or fix the deepest quality of their culture in their home, at work and in themselves in those relationships to build something that as the boundaries grow in the future, they're just building a higher quality outcome in their, of their impact. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, uh, maybe you could talk to us a little bit more about bionic and in, in the journey, um, that you've been taking with that company. And also, um, as a piece of that, maybe you talk a little bit about the vision of where you're, where it's headed, where you're headed with bionic and, and the impact that you're looking to make. Um, you know, I was talking about championship leaders, have this incredible vision that a lot of other people can't see and yet they also have the courage to to take action on it i think football i think bill belichick and nick saban right i mean they continue to show up at the top of uh the world's most competitive levels against the best of the best and they all you know whatever they can see is a little bit different than everybody else and and they're, they're able to continue to evolve and and stay ahead of the game so so maybe you could talk to us a little bit more about Bionic and the journey that you've been yeah. with that. And then, yeah, just the vision and the impact that you're looking to make maybe in the short term, the next five years or so. Yeah. So I share the purpose, which is to ignite growth revolutions. What that means is, is that I, my prediction of the future, which we've had for years now, is, is that most large organizations would need to be refounded. That disruption was real. In fact, we had to spend... I spent most of my kind of time selling, so to speak, although you can't really sell what we do. It's sort of more like you share it and then, mm -hmm. you know, the universe takes care of the rest, which is true about us. Um, but I think it's, you know, we, we have to explain that disruption was real and we never, ever have to do that again. It's actually saved a ton of time because <laughs> anybody who's gone through this life, this life experience realized like, wow, we control a lot less. And what disruption really is, is not some theoretical, you know, AI future, although that's True. Um, it's actually just when behaviors change, needs change, right? Our customer problem that we solve, whether we have a product or service, and there's nothing other than those two things, it's not complicated, um, is it changed. And the question is, is did we recognize the change? Did we, did we solve the new need as it changed with us? So that really asks the question is, 
does the company learn? And you can't learn if you can't unlearn. And that's the question that you ask a CEO. Does your organization learn? And underneath that is the question of, does our organization tell the truth? Okay. And so this is, this is the deepest meaning, which is if you have an organization that's largely intellectually dishonest because they have to be right, you're in deep trouble. And that's a reflection of you because the cost of failure is too high and there's not truth in the room because of the addiction of being right because you don't learn. So these are very wow. profound ideas that have to be fixed. How do you, uh, how do you work through those questions? Because I don't, my mind goes to, of, I'm going to be, of course I learn. And of course I tell the truth, right? I would imagine, is that, or are people like really brutally honest and, and say, well, uh, you know, how, how does that conversation go? I just, do you have to work through some, some things to really get to the root of what the truth is for those two, two questions? Well, I think, I think there's, there is a complex answer, but I'll, I'll share some sort of like lenses to view it through. So, so mindset's really important. Like lens, the lenses you view the world through affect almost everything. So there's, a, you know, Carol Dweck has been writing about mindset for the last couple of years. Bionic has led, I think pioneered in the world. It's kind of a one-of-one -one company now. The growth mindset and systems that lead to growth and transformation for some of the largest organizations in the world from General Mills to P&G to Citigroup and others have all adopted this model to like really transform themselves, to put the whole company on offense. But what you have to recognize is that when you're successful, in most cases, it has nothing to do with you. It's an outside force, which means we don't control it, right? Planning is stuff you can control, balance sheet, budgets, you know, brands, you know, but when you're actually trying to win the future, it's about being there when it happens, it's all about the outside force and how that changes problems and needs. And the question of like, how are we solving it? What's our proprietary gift to solve that need? And so while that sounds you know, simple, in fact, the hardest thing in the world to do is to make a concept simple. These are complex things underneath them. So this isn't like happy talk. Underneath this is skill, right? We gotta be able to have people who can run experimentation to learn that's based effectively in science that we can believe. So it's my insurance that I can believe it is not money, right? Yeah. It's speed, right? So if I can, if I can get the answer for 50 grand instead of 5 million and I can get it in three weeks versus three months, what, 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 what answer should I accept? Right. Right. And so I think there's this conflation of confidence and um, time and more time, the more confident the answer is true, which is not true in disruption. And secondly is money. Like we got to spend more to be right. I think you need to do more. You need to run more experiments you need to surround disruption with not five big bets that a big consulting firm tells you. You need to launch 100 with a 93% failure rate. And that number is specific. So when you look back up, 70% of all the growth that you ever get from your investments in growth come from 7% um, of your capital deployed. So I make 100 bets where I spend 100 million, 7% of that, in this case, seven bets or 7 million, is gonna make all the money I ever make. So 93% goes to zero. So the question is, most you know, advanced leaders would be like, we should just make more of the seven bets, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Or the right question is, is why do we make those bets? Yeah. And the answer is, um, one, you can't. You have to experience the failure to know the seven. It teaches yeah. you. Secondly is, when you go to the beginning, you say, well, why do we make those bets? They have two signals. First is conviction, which is a way to say, why now and why us? Outside force means proprietary gift. We're on time. And the second signal in investing in the beginning is non-consensus. You make all of your money from the ideas with the highest disagreement rate. So conversely, when you have consensus, you're basically screwed because it's <laughs> yeah. planning. That yeah. means we know, in this case, you're learning. So we're actually looking for discomfort because that's where growth lives. We're looking for new because it's not known. So we want things where there's friction. We want things that are hard to understand. We want it to be new to the world and new to us. So these, this, this mindset around, we, I, we call this TAM to TAP, is to shift the organization from a TAM, a total addressable marketplace view of the world, where the big to bigger captures the budgets and behaviors and the products today, to a total addressable problem view of the world, where we actually say, no, we're not in the beer business, we're in the enhanced experience business. No, we're not making trucks, we're in transportation. We happen to make trucks, right? No, we're not in the personal computing. We're in the connection business. We don't make PCs. We make, we make great meetings. 
Like the, we really back up and you think, well, what's the actual customer need in the world we're solving for? That's where permission begins because an entrepreneur's advantage over a large organization is that you can use anything to solve it. If you can only be successful because you have to make your existing products work inside out, what a massive disadvantage in the moment of disruption. You have to refound the company around the problems and needs from the outside in in a non-consensus high conviction model that helps you discover why us, why now. And that us part may need to change. Yeah. We may need to give up old things and pick up new technologies or new solutions. But that ultimately to come full circle, Nate, is, is it, it is that it's about the leader. Can the leader create truth and unlearn to create, pick up a new truth and create growth? Yeah. Yeah. Powerful. What, um, what would be like a critical moment for you? Um, turning point, uh, fork in the road where obviously you made the decision that you did that has you where you are today, but had you made a different decision, took a different path, um, be in a very different place than you are right now. I think again, a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs that especially after this year, um, probably are in that situation and it, it's powerful to learn from others that, that have been there and to hear how they've responded and how they've chose and decided in those moments. So is there yeah. uh, a moment for you that comes to mind you can share? Absolutely. Um, so I've had four companies, uh, three exits, two worked, one didn't. Raised a lot of venture capital, bootstrapped this company now to, to 25 million in revenue and growing. Um, and I, there's no way I could have done this business had I not gone through the moment you're describing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to start over. So I've, I've gone through success and failure twice, built back twice. Um, and in those moments, I like, the last one in particular, I almost quit. Because I was, you know, in my 30s, I was an entrepreneur. I had mul a couple, I was a founder and CEO a couple of times. And you realize, you ask the question, like, am I any good at this? And you got to remember, like, if it's outside forces, market timing, like 83% of startups failed within five years because very often they're not, they misunderstand in their mindset what they're trying to solve for. And they die before that actual thing happens. Their, their timing is off, their prediction. Yeah. Or their prediction is right and they fail to execute. But anyway, so I had this moment with a friend of mine named David Smith. That's his actual name. He's a brilliant guy. He's my chief revenue officer in my last company. And we had, I don't know, a little under 200 employees. We raised tens of millions of venture and we were failing. And the reason why we were failing is because we actually built two companies at once. We lost focus. And I didn't even know at the time. Um, and so he called me one night. I know this now upon reflection because it's a straight path when you look backwards, right? <laughs> um, and so he called me one night and he said, you know, David, you know, why are you making this so hard? And I was like, what are you talking about, David? He goes, you know, you're accelerating the failure of the company. And I was like, I I'm killing myself. Like, what do you think? Kind of was like a street fight. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, um, he goes, the reason why this is failing is because this company is driven by you and you are fear. And what he was saying is that I, was, I, my will to make sure this company didn't die, right, mm -hmm. was the only thing the company had. And I wasn't asking anyone for help. I was the visionary. I was the CEO. It's going to happen, right? Yeah. It was against all, I was a hero's journey. But the reality is, is that in any journey, you're not alone. You're with others. And if you don't bring them truth and you don't ask them for the help, no one can help you. In fact, the universe can't help you. God help you because no one can help you because it's really all about you. And I say, he said, you know, David, this is going to break you, which it almost did. He goes, and it will never be successful unless you give it over. And I was like, give it over to what? What are you, what are you talking about? So theoretical. He's like, give it over to, give it over to God, give it over to the universe. And I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> he goes, it means that when you give it over, you accept all of the outcomes. Yeah. You get, you, you break through the myth that you're in control here. In fact, the very fact you're not in control means you're going to ask. You're going to ask for the help you need. You're going to ask it from God. You're going to ask it from your employees, your investor, because you have humility to ask for the truth. And I, I said, I said, do you mean, does that mean failure? He goes, yes, it does. And I said, my next time was like public failure. <laughs> like, like, and he's like, that's exactly in public failure. cover business inside. I was like, <laughs> uh, I realized like the, the whole purpose of the company, right? Cause it's here karmically to teach you lessons was to break me, to teach me you're not in control. I got this. Yeah. And I, I, I literally couldn't work any harder. And I just 
accepted it. And I, I laid on the ground. I said, okay, I gave it over. And I cried. Mid thirties, three little kids. And I went to bed that night. It was the first night I slept. I woke up the next morning with massive doubt. And so this was the crossroads. Um, and I was reflecting on this, kind of meditating. And I realized that I was like, I, the metaphor I would use is I was sprinting as hard as I could down a road that I did not know where it was taking me. And it was full of thorns. And the harder I ran, the faster I was bleeding out. Mm -hmm. And I realized like, I got to get on a new road. And I just literally, because I was like, maybe I should, maybe I suck at this. Just get rid of the company. I should start over and get a job, honestly. I really thought that was the right answer. And so I just decided at that moment, I was like, you know what? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put myself and my mindset on a clean road. And I, I'm, this is the metaphor. I lifted myself off out of that road and I put myself onto a clean road. But I, the key was I started that road 15 years in the future. Actually, when I was 20. So that would have been like, yeah, about 15 years. I started over like I was 20. Yeah. And I actually felt totally naive. Like kind of like, oh, this is foolish. Yeah. But the truth is, is that all of the truths about my life and everything that was possible was all still true. I just need to re-up and yeah. re-believe, but go back and begin. And I did. And I got to tell you, I, 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 as I was sitting there, I was like, this is one of the most courageous decisions of my life. I gave myself permission to start over. And I did. And kind of the rest is history. Like, you know, between... Literally 60 days later, later, quote unquote, out of the blue, I got a phone call. Do you want to sell your company? We exited. I was out of the company within 90 yeah. days. How does that happen, by the way? Yeah. I wrote my first book, The Startup Playbook. I went out and got 300 years of, of wisdom, you know, all at once from Elon and Reed Hoffman and sale. just how to, it became the five lenses about how to bet your life that became bionic. And here we are with this incredible company changing the world, leading a leveraged life, all because of that reset. And so that is such a critical question. And it's, it's, it's a holy one to me because it allowed me to start over again and begin again. And that, there's a lot of that that's needed right now. This refounding moment is for everyone, for companies, it's for themselves, but more important, it's for the interior life of, of themselves. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And so essentially what you were saying or what you're your friend was saying was uh, that you needed to surrender, right? Mm -hmm. Surrender to the outcome. And, and uh, that's a difficult for, thing for people to do, isn't it? It is if you believe in, that you can control things. Yeah. You, could, you, can, you, you are um, uh, all of the options of your success or failure are available to you, right? And once you accept you don't control them, then you can ask for the ones that you want. And this sounds very meta, very ethereal, but it's actually quite true. I mean, um, because you're actually open. Mm -hmm. And there's just, when you're open, you put on a new set of lessons that says, I don't have the answers and I'm open to whatever the outcomes are. And I'm asking for them. It's amazing what happens. Yeah. There's a famous line that Ben Franklin used. I mean, he wrote this book. He's written a bunch of books. I can't remember which one it was very famous ones. I'm blanking. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are literally like, oh, that's the book. But he also said, he goes, one of the fastest way to befriend someone is asked to borrow their pen. Can I borrow your pen name? And what you're triggering, it's so counterintuitive, which is people actually want to be wanted. They want to help you. Yeah, right. But most leaders are like, I, no, I don't need anybody's help, which is totally isolating, which means there's no answers coming to you. There's no solutions coming. No one needs your help. You're totally alone. And then you do that for 20 years, you do that for five years in a startup, you're dead. Yeah. The vulnerability is to ask. Yeah. You're the bridge back to the team. The truth is the bridge back to you. And that asking for the pen is asking for help. And you need to do it all the time. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, as, we, as we start to wrap up here, um, if there were one or two things that you could give to the listeners that, you know, if they were to take implement put into action for their life today would help move them forward today what would those be as we wrap this up i mean th these are i think we this is gonna again i this is a super meta time together i don't know why but it's it's important which is you're asking like what is leadership and there's that famous line which says you can't if you can't lead yourself you can't lead others right mm -hmm. and so if you don't think very deeply about these things you're kind of like transactional and, and honestly you're kind of like programmatically leading. And I, 
read a bunch of books and act in the books. And I and like great leaders are really thinkers who happen to create systems that great people become in, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so in a way, like if you haven't figured out the, the what's underneath, imagine, imagine this, imagine like the letter T, like your reality, your life is a bunch of decisions, right? Choices you make yeah. for yourself for others. So the question is, they're really not choices, they're intentions. <laughs> what, do I, what am I intentionally choosing that's creating my reality, my company, my life, et cetera? And the question is, if you don't know what you're intentionally choosing, your reality, your company's success, your success is really not at all in your control, yeah. right? You just, you think you're in control because of the activities you're doing, but you're actually not leading it, right? Yeah. Because the, what's underneath the choice of the intention is the why. Why do I intentionally make this choice that leads these outcomes for myself, for the company, my role? So if you can't get to the why, right? And know, know if you're like some performance junkie living your life out of shame, you know, whatever those things are, like you, you can never really affect the outcome. You can just demand it from other people. You can say, perform this way and we'll be successful. And that's really not a sustainable equation. Yeah. So part of the leadership is to have the courage to ask why. Why do I intentionally make these choices? And if I don't like the answer, the outcome, I got to get underneath the why. I need to know it. But when you discover what's underneath the why, once you can answer that question, that's where the power lives. Because what's underneath the why is only literally one of two questions, and that is love or fear. And if 99.99% of your life and the company's existence is driven out of fear, you will never have success. Yeah. You yourself or your company. So the question is, is how do I get to a place where I'm not leading out of fear? I know I'm making intentional choices from the right place, love and abundance, with non-zero thinking, and the company can go answer the questions, right? With truth. These, these concepts are really, I, I personally think are what under great leadership looks like, but are not some ethereal thing. They're actually the deep work. They're the, how you, the lens you view the roll through and that you're mentally prepared every day to lead from an origin, a center that's impossible to defeat yeah, because you did work. Yeah. So I think if you're look, looking for something that is um, to get right, I think the external aspects of the locus of power cannot be from the outside in. It begins in the kernel, the deepest kernel inside, what's, which is your why and what's underneath the why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Powerful. Appreciate that. What's, um, what are a few ways that the listeners can find out more about you and what you got going on and uh, sure. Bionic? So lot, lots of different nodes in this one. So if you're, if you're listening and you're in a, in a big organization uh, and you want growth, you can always go to onbionic, O-N-B-I-O-N-I-C.com, onbionic and learn more about our work. You can all, there's a great book we just published called New to Big, which is really about the kind of 1.0 of what we do, the growth OS about entrepreneurship and venture capital as forms of management. It's almost like the anti-Six Sigma of our generation in a way. Um, at a more personal level, I do lots of keynotes and speaking, uh, written a bunch of books, the Startup Playbook, the Intellectual Devotional, and you can learn more about that at David S, as in Steve Kidder, K-I-D-D-E-R.com. Um, and of course on LinkedIn and other places, I do a fair amount of writing when we can. But Nate, thank you for this time together. I really appreciate it and believe in your work and thank you for your service um, and uh, bringing that mindset to, to companies and, and leadership. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, same to you, David. Thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your day. Uh, really appreciate it. It's been, a, it's been a blast. I've, I've enjoyed it. So thank you. Awesome.